All right, welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. It is getting warm out here. I'm out in my backyard finally. I am able to get out in the sunshine and out in the beautiful hills by my home. So here we go. This Let's do another Bobby Fischer, couple of Bobby Fischer games. He's playing a guy named Swank. Again, the Sicilian defense. Fisher's playing black. Oh, get out of here, fly. See? These videos are so popular, even the flies want to learn chess from me. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's pure vanity, right? Nobody wants to learn chess from me. We want to learn from Bobby Fisher. That's why I'm showing you the Bobby Fisher games. Yeah, yeah, baby. Okay, now, an interesting... He came to E2 in this opening. Kind of different, huh? Knight C6. Now, realize, again, like I've said in other videos, the knight movement here... Oh, hey, do you like that uh, copper bracelet my wife made me? That's kind of cool looking, isn't it? Nifty little design. We're doing some, uh, we're doing some metalworking, jewelry and stuff like that. I'm going to start doing some, some more jewelry. The, the, now back to reality here. The knight here is hitting these squares and these squares, right? Had he brought the knight to here, these squares would not be hit. This one would, but that one wouldn't. It switches. So you can see, whoops. Where is it? That one in the <laughs> free. You can see the different emphasis in the center and the influence, which in turn affects where you're going to move your pawns, doesn't it? That's, that's just good to know, just something. So this move does not have the same effect as this move. And I know all of you are saying, no kidding, dork. Just something to observe. For a lot of beginners, that makes a difference, right? I just want, I want us to be aware that this changes the game somewhat. So knight e2, and now knight c6, yes, or oh, now b3. So he's going to fianchetto his bishop. Now, and this is what I wanted to show you, knight f6. Now, Fisher has put both of his knights on the sixth here instead of down here. Because of the way white has opened, watch this. Knight b to c3, now... Okay, hang on, I'm going to show you this. E6, Bobby is being cautious in the center at this point instead of making two pawn move, a pawn move of two squares because now he can bring this one out and hit this square twice, right? If he so chooses. Just showing you some of the nuances. Now, bishop b2. Now, what does the fianchetto bishop point to? My hair's in my... I've got to get a haircut and a beard trim. I look like... Uh, yeah, Rocky Mountain man, chess player. The knight hits here. This knight, because he came here, is hitting this square. So is this fianchetto bishop. That square. Now notice the C pawn contends for the D4 square. In order to help control that square for white, the knight move here and the fianchetto bishop does that because this pawn is past that square. I'm just showing you. Just showing you. And like I said, the reason he moved the e6 is so that he can thrust the d5. Okay? So we're having a battle for the center. And now this enables white to come to g3, protecting this pawn. From here, he couldn't. Yes, he's got it protected here. He's not leaving it hanging. But notice how the knight move, yeah, it's another knight move. You've got to keep that in mind too. But now he's got this pawn double protected because this pawn is double hit. It helps understand a little bit of why they're making the moves they do when we look at the squares that the knights and the pawns and the bishops are influencing. I'm just... I, it's, it's obvious in general, but there's a lot of beginners who haven't got to that point yet. So I'm pointing it out for them also. It's also a good review. Mikhail Tal. 
the world champion, Tall, you know, the one we all love to watch play because he was so fantastic with tactics. He said, even after he was a world champion, he said, oh, I love to look at the kids' chess puzzles. And people laughed at him for that. He said, oh, no, 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 no. You always help yourself by re-reviewing the basics. In tactics, well, okay. In chess openings, review the basics. Don't ever think that's a waste of time. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay, so. Bishop. Bishop to d6 here. So we're getting a good development. Bishop b5 comes way up here. Again, that bishop move pins this knight, which means... Because it's pinned against the king, it's a solid pin. That knight cannot move, right? So that tells us that this square is up for grabs even stronger. Because this knight can no longer protect that square. I'm just showing that to you. Same thing with this square. The influence of this knight is minimalized by that bishop pin. Yes, generic basic information, but it's good to note. It's good to see. And then we castle. Oh, here comes my neighbor. They're probably going to stop and hassle me. Bishop to d3. So the pin was temporary. He brings his bishop back. And that's just the way he did it that way. And now the knight comes to e5. So we can see the manipulation, the, the movement of trying to figure out what is the best, he's got a target here, what is the best way to give my center the strongest center possible. And that bishop b2, now you can see what white... Uh, the bishop moves, I know, uh, Fisher has made several moves with pieces too, but those bishop moves that white has been moving, uh, and now he's gone back, it did not improve his position necessarily but look at Fisher's position through acquiring the target and making him move further and further back Fisher's center has become magnificent that is crucial to see this in the process of acquiring targets one of our pillars pushing his bishop back White has not improved his center Black has. That's critical to see. I'm just pointing that out. So, knight g6. So, now Fisher's going to come to this side, and now knight to b5. Here comes Black, acquiring targets. Knight will take e4. Acquires a target himself. Knight will take e4. What he's going to do is he's going to swap off a couple of knights here because it will clarify the center and who has the influence in the center, which of course will determine how they can attack each other, right? And then knight takes d6, so he acquired his target. So in this game, Fisher does not have the bishop pair. He gave up the bishop pair, but he's going to use a different stratagem than just his bishops, right? g3. Uh, and this is interesting because here, here's another really cool little micro lesson here. Black no longer has the bishop pair, white does. Does this move improve the position so white can use his bishop pair more effectively? And the answer is no. So, let's take a brief moment and look and see it would be better if you have the bishop pair. See the pawns in the center of the board? It would be better to open the board even more. Because bishops need an open space to run through. That's where they're most effective. So the d3 pawn push would have been better, according to Muller. He said that is the move that he should have done to get the center more open for his bishop pair. So that's a cool little thing to see. Instead, he went to g3. So let's see how this affects white in his, in his game, right? And now e5. 
The double ponds, true, but they're not blockaded, and Fisher is advancing them, and they're completely centralized. Those are not weak. Uh, depends on the position. Double ponds can be weak. Not those. Those are wonderful double ponds, right? The other advantage that double ponds give is when you get your rooks into play, on either side of the double ponds, you can have an open file, right? So in this instance, those pawns are terrific. Don't kid yourself. So keeping that in mind, C4, he's going to stop the advancement of this pawn at this point. That's not why he's moving it, but it does stop the advancement. Bishop comes to H3. Bishop goes down to F1, and this is too slow. This is way too slow. Fisher is obviously trying to prevent White from castling his king, right? What White should have done, rather than Mickey Mouse with the bishop, what White should have done is just queen c2 and castled queenside, right? That's what Muller said in the book. If you're going to castle, then do it quick because the attack is going to come faster than you think. Instead, by trying to swap the bishops, it's too slow. And, of course, Fisher recognized that, so he does swap the bishop because it prevents the kingside castle. Now Fisher knows if, if his opponent is going to castle, he has to go to the queen side, and that can be advantageous. Bumps the f5, here we go. Queen does come to c2 at this point. Oh, the wind's coming up. I hope it's not goofing up that microphone. I apologize if it is. It's been a while since I've done outdoor video, so I'm trying to learn where to place the camera in relation to wind and sun and all that. So forgive me if these aren't as good as they will be. Just be patient with me, grasshoppers. Yes. So the queen does come to c2, and uh, knight comes back to e7. Now we get a wonderful illustration of what Jeremy Silman talks about in his books. The knight here is not going to be very effective if white castles queenside. So in order to not leave a piece out of the fight, whether you have defense or offense, put the knight where it belongs. It's out of play on this side of the board. So if it takes you four moves to get to where the knight needs to be, then make those four moves. Silman is adamant about that. We see a fabulous illustration of this in this Bobby Fischer game. Let's watch. This is really important to understand because if you don't rearrange where on the board all of your pieces are, you're going to leave one or two of them out. That means you're going to have less power, whether for defense or offense. So this is a beautifully logical explanation of what Bobby Fischer is doing. His knight is going to greener pastures. He castled on the queen's side. Put the pieces over here. Isn't that awesome to see? That is really wonderful to see. If you're wondering, well, now what do I do with my knight? Put your knight where the king is going to be able to be attacked. Now that makes sense. Now we understand why he's making these knight moves, and he makes several of them. And now we get it. Bishop c3, and now knight d4. What an outpost, right? Holy cow, that's awesome. You can see the difference. No kidding, even if you're a beginner. Let's just take a brief moment. One, he's hitting the queen. He's on the king's side. He can disrupt if he decides he wants to do a knight sacrifice. Once he gets everything else arranged, a knight sacrifice now would just be stupid. No, no, you've got to arrange your setup first before you do a piece sacrifice. Otherwise, you're just throwing the piece away. But look, he does have a target to possibly disrupt the king cover, and those pawns have moved forward, so there's weak squares here. He has a target square here to get to the king. He's hitting the queen, but he's on this side, and that knight, if it's allowed to stay there, is going to completely cripple the white position. Look at the difference in the power of here. Three moves later, compared to there. What a great re That alone is worth watching this game. 
That principle right there, that can improve our chess, no question. And, and you say, well, he hasn't developed a... Forget that for the moment. The guy castled queenside. Get your pieces over there. Technically speaking, his rook is already there. Yeah, I know he's not on open file. I know he hasn't moved, that's true. But an A pawn thrust will bust open that king side and the rook will be behind it. So it's better than worrying about bringing your rook over here, over here, over here for three moves. It's better to put another piece who isn't involved. Bam, bam, bam. Much better to do that. I love that part of this game. That's the chess lesson for this game as far as I'm concerned. The importance of the minor pieces. Let Bobby Fischer show us. They're critical. What an outpost. Now, how do you handle that? How do you handle that? Get rid of that knight. <laughs> if, if you have someone who's done that to you, get rid of that knight. That knight is way too strong. There's no way you can leave that knight there. Don't, don't move your queen out of danger. Get rid of that outpost. Yeah, that's the way to do it. And now, because Fisher took a few moves and got his knight where it needed to be on the optimal square, which of course was the double support of that post, now look at his pawn center. He undoubled his pawns and pow! My card ran out. I hope I didn't skip any of the commentary. I was just pointing out that because Fisher moved the knight up to here on that outpost and then forced an exchange, now his pawn center is extremely strong. I love this. What a great illustration. This alone is worth watching this game for this principle. And the king responds, king b1. And now you get the rook involved, rook a e8. And I know I said there's a chance that he could push the a pawn and all. Notice that he didn't do it that way at this point. His pawn center is just fabulous. But he is getting all of his pieces involved. Yeah. First he took care of his center. First he brought a piece over that needed to be in the battle. And it helped him because it exchanged a defender of white's piece for one of his. And now he's going to get a file to attack with. Because he's got the pawns, the mobile pawns, to open up a file. This is wonderful illustration of how to do it, man. This is awesome. Rook F to E1. Yeah, don't give him that file. I, I mean, when you see your opponent doing it, boy, he's got pawns here that can open files. And he starts putting his rooks on files. So do you. You don't let him have those files if you can at all help it. No, they're, they're way too powerful. So that rook move makes sense also. Yeah, it does, really. And rook e5, get on the files and then use them. Yeah, yeah. d3, okay, now the files are going to open eventually. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, rook fe8, double the rooks. Fisher can pull the trigger and open this file anytime. Double the rooks and then you'll have the file. That's, that makes sense why he's doing that. Right? Okay. Uh, queen d2. Now white's starting to get a little antsy, I suspect. Open the file. Absolutely. Here comes the open file. And of course he will exchange the rook. And the rook will exchange the rook. Oh, no, 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 no. No, the rook did not. I'm sorry. The queen did. He took it with the queen backed by the rook on the open file. Yeah, that, that gives him a stronger uh, attack. Queen takes the pawn. And now, blam. Queenie too. Oh, here comes the wind. I hope it's not goofing up this microphone. I apologize if it does. Just bear with me. I'll figure this all out as I practice more outside. Queen takes. Now, white doesn't want to exchange here. 
I better let this guy go by so that we can hear what we're talking about, right? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm making chess videos. They're gawking, you know, people gawk all the time. Okay, now, you do not ask white. Why don't we exchange that queen? Why? I mean, material basically is even. So if you change down, wouldn't that help? No, because at this point, that gives Fisher that file. And if the queen takes and the rook takes, he's got the seventh rank. He has the initiative and he has targets and he has the attack. So you would not, if you were white, you would not exchange the queens. That makes sense, doesn't it? Once you recognize, ah, oh, that's why he put the queen, that's why he put the queen there. It makes sense. He wanted the file plus the seventh rank, and white doesn't give it to him. So this is a good strategy that white does. What does white do? White goes rook d2. So what white did is, Rather than exchanging queens on e2, white forced the exchange of queens on d3. And he kept control of the situation. He goes rookie one check, king c2. You say, does that look like he's got control? Yeah, he does. It's okay. You watch. Rook e2 check. That's fine. And now rook d2. So Fisher wasn't given a chance to wipe out and have a lot of targets on that seventh rank. White played this really well. In my opinion, he really did good. So, of course, you have to take the rook and the king takes. And then they played king takes d2. And then now watch what Fisher does. He immediately begins hitting the, uh, the formation. On, they both have the three pawns. His f pawn is going to bump up. Fisher has the advantage in the pawn end game, right? So he's going to bump the pawn. King comes to d3. King comes to f7. A3, this is a great endgame study. This is the other part of this game. Not only did we get a sparkling jewel of fabulous instruction on the knight movements and the central power, but now we get a splendid game of kings and pawns endgame. This is wonderful to see. This game is very valuable for this. Seven... A3, king of six, centralize your king, of course. B4, here come the white pawns. He's going to try to break up the, the uh, pawn majority of Fisher so that Fisher can't bump any of those pawns in, and then the fight will be on this side of the board. But Fisher's beat him to this here. Let's see if that strategy works. Before Fisher goes to B6. Hey, neighbor. People gawk all the time. <laughs> they wonder, what is that? That looks like a chessboard out in the wilderness. Hey, chess in the wilderness. What the heck? It's in my backyard, man. Fisher is going to maintain control of this side with the pawn battle, right? So he keeps everything in contact. No weak squares here is what he's trying to do, it looks like to me. King e4, here comes the central kings. King g5, watch this, watch this, this is so cool. It's amazing how he does this. Now g takes, f check, and you're thinking, Fisher, you blew it. King g4, f3 check, king h3, f5, and you go, how on earth did Fisher not blow it? Just watch. King takes h2, f4, king g3, awesome, now he starts pulling the trigger on this side, b takes, b4, 
takes, he's got a couple of ponds together, a past pond, a past pond here, right? He's got double ponds. Oh, I hope that wind's not goofing this up. I'm in an important part of the game. Halt! <laughs> okay, let me keep going. This is really cool. A four, so the game is getting tense here. A five, put the stop in the middle. It'll buy you time if you make a mistake. His pond won't be down here. It'll be way back here. So that's what fish are doing, right? King D5, and you've got, what? Come on. Oh, yeah, 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 this was, <laughs> this is where white blew it. That's the mistake. Here, King D5, now Fisher goes here. He's in. He's got it. Yes, he takes a pawn, it doesn't matter. D2, and white resigned. The cool part about this endgame is, Fisher ensured by marching his king all the way and taking that h2 pawn, he ensured a pawn in. Nice to know. Now, true, the battle was over here, and yes, White's king was over there. He didn't react a lot over here. He had, he made sure he had two passed pawns, kings and pawns. But a king can only move one square at a time. So can a pawn. If you can have a pawn on this side of the board going in and a pass pawn on this side of the board to go in, you can win your king pawn endgame. I mean, that game has it all. That was fabulous. I love that kind of chess game. So anyway, there's your chess video. Another Bobby Fischer's chess game. Spectacular chess game. Lots of wonderful instruction. Well worth watching this video several times if you didn't get why the first time. Feel free to watch this several times because that's valuable. We're beginning to see Bobby Fischer play like Bobby Fischer that we've all grown to love. Unless, of course, you're Russian. <laughs> you didn't love him, but you sure studied him. Anyway, thanks for watching my Backyard Professor Chess videos. You guys have a great day. I'm going to go wander around the hills, and then I'll upload this later on today. And in the meantime, be good, do, do well, have fun. Get outside a little bit. Enjoy the world. It's a beautiful place, man. Don't get so caught up in our busy routine of life that you don't stop and smell the dandelions. In my case, I like to smell the sagebrush because it's such a fabulous smell. So spring is here. Let's enjoy it. All right, I'll see you guys in the next Backyard Professor Chess videos. Remember, be nice to each other. Be nice to everybody. The world needs more nice. We can do this. We can do this. I'm not kidding. Thanks, you guys. See you next time.